Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 291 for Monday, February 8th, 2021. And welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here as usual in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. There we are. Napomo and opposite sides of the country. It's, it, you really are. It, yeah. I mean, it's almost and as far apart days, as you can get. Yeah. yeah it, it is. And, you know, these days I, I do reflect often we haven't seen each other in a long time <laughs> and, that's true. and it's probably going to be a while more before we do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 We used to have, we, you know, in June, our paths would cross sometimes in January, you know, like we crossed it at a CES yeah. a while ago, but uh, this is, this is a long time for it. It's two years since we've it'll, seen it'll be two years coming June. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Well, that's how it goes. You know, I'm glad we get to do this, not just for us, but for everybody listening. So thanks for listening. Yeah. Folks. yeah. I, um, I, I mentioned it last week that I was basically finishing our show and then heading straight to the theater to begin what is known in the business as tech week for, uh, for the show that I'm doing called next to normal. And it, it was, it's been, and it was, uh, and it has been an interesting week. This is, arguably one of the toughest shows, Broadway type shows to do to, from a music standpoint, just because the, the songs are, this show worked out brilliantly for the, the, the people who made it. Uh, I'm going to have, get their names mixed up, but anyway, the, there's two guys, Brian Kitts and Tom York or Brian York and Tom Kitts. I can't remember, but um, it, it, it has, it's a show about uh, mental illness specifically, bipolar disorder and it's about a woman who suffers from it and then her family who you know sort of has to uh, also suffers from it right mm -hmm. um but um and the, and the music is it matches that <laughs> there's this, there is very there are very few places in the in the music where you can just get comfortable and play like a rock song right they sound like rock songs but they might only have six or seven bar phrases or there might be beats dropped here or there. And I always thought of it as they were being, they were sort of matching the music to the vibe that they were trying to create. And maybe that's what they were doing. Looking at their, their other work since then though, everything is too clever by half to steal a term from Andrew, our, our music director hmm. and, and isn't really any good in my opinion. Like the songs just aren't good songs. Whereas in this show, the songs are actually really good. And then it all sort of fits together, but it, it, it's difficult. And we basically had one run through before we opened our preview with an audience on Thursday night. We, we got together Tuesday and played essentially what you and I would call band rehearsal, um, where we played the songs and the singers sang the songs. They might've done some light blocking, moving around just to get their spots on stage and things like that. But we did not run the show Tuesday night, Wednesday, we ran it. And then Thursday, we ran it as a preview in front of the crowd. And then Friday was the official opening. And there are, you know, I've played this show technically twice before, although the, the runs were almost back to back seven years ago. And um, back then, I never, I, I, there wasn't much I remembered from this. Um, there were, like, I think I said this last week, but there, the, the, and I never really memorized the show I just, I, I got to know it well enough that I could read it and get mostly everything right. This is the first time I'm playing it on drums with sticks. Last time we didn't have mics on the cast, so it was with rods and brushes only. And there are certainly some songs that call for rods or brushes regardless, but um, the, you know, the full on rock tunes are, are generally played with sticks. And so that part's been different for me, but it's been, it's interesting. There was, there was a moment um, there, there's what I would call the hardest piece in the show. It's a song, song called wish I were here. And it has, let me see if I can get this right. It, it, the hard section of this hardest song, it goes from four, four to a measure of two, four, to a measure of three, eight, to a vamp in seven, eight, Oops. to a measure of three, eight coming out of the vamp back into seven, eight, but a different groove. And with this performance, 
the actors are making like a change every beat six while they're singing. And so they wanted a hit on the drums on beat six for four bars in of seven, eight. It's like, okay, Yeesh. yep. And then um, a bar of six, eight, and then a, a one bar of four, four, a bar of one, four, and then I think six bars of four, four, and and then a a bar of four four to end the phrase, but it's syncopated. It's like this, you know, and and then that's the end of the the mayhem of this song. And it's always been tri tricky to play this for obvious reasons, right? And uh, and it just like I, I was noticing that, especially with this weird hits on six and that sort of thing, it was like, man. This is this is really hard, and I came back home and I played it. And it's on six or hits on four in in a. In, you say no hits, hits on, four, on six, beat eight? six of a seven eight oh. measure. So there's four seven eight measures that that have a hit on beat six of each one, and then and, mm -hmm. and I started messing around with it, and then I realized, oh, I should set that up, even though it's a movement hit. I should set it up like I do a horn hit, right? Like you know, horn uh, when when horns have a hit. The, the, especially in like jazz or big band music, the general practice for the, the drummer is not just a hit. Like if it's on the end of two, you don't hit just the end of two. You might hit, you know, the end of one and then two to set it up. Like you might do, but don't bah, right. To, to set that up both for the listener, but mm -hmm. also for the players so that everybody hits it on the same thing. So I thought, Oh, I should set this up like a horn hit, which I, I, I added and it. It really, everybody really liked it. It worked. It was, it was the right thing to do. But I, you know, I came home and I'm like, okay, this is, it's difficult music, but it's certainly not abundantly difficult that it's impossible to get right. And I started thinking, well, you know, the actors have memorized this. So I started, I didn't intend to memorize it, but I started thinking about, I need to learn the lyrics and I need to learn to play this song, not this difficult math problem. Right. And, and so I played it through a few times, just trying to sort of grok it, um, knowing that it has to be right because we're not even on stage. This is of all the theater shows I've done. This one is organized more like a traditional theater show than anything I've ever done um, mm -hmm. where it's real. Like it, the, they brought in a director from New York. I mean, I know some of the people in the cast, but in terms of the organization of the theater, like I'm not even it, it, like the whole structure is it's, it's very much just show up. I see the band. Uh, I mean, I know some people in the cast, so I might say hi to them or whatever, but you know, everybody's we're, we're working on social distancing and making sure all of that, everybody's wearing masks all the time and all that stuff. And so, um, so it's like, okay, you know, I mean, I got to get it right because they're on stage over there. I'm, you know, backstage playing this here. I, there's no room for improvisation, especially in this particular section. Right. And so I went through it a couple of times and then got to the theater and we played it a little bit. And, uh, you know, Thursday night it went okay. You know, I think I hit that beat six on two of the four bars as I was like trying to figure out the logistics of it, uh, in real time. And then Friday night, we got to the theater and we did like vocal warmups and, and which means they do their vocal warmups. They do a sound check and then we do a sound check together, which is usually like the finale song or something where everybody's singing to get, you know, to make it easy to get levels and all this stuff. In the huh. room. And, um, and then our keyboard player, who's also our music director, Andrew started playing the riff leading into this difficult section. And, and so I just started playing it with him and it was just the two of us. The cast was off doing whatever they were doing, wherever they were. Nobody else in the pit was playing along with us. And I think he was just playing it to give himself, you know, more reps on this. And so I started playing along with him and he counted us out of this vamp like he would in the show, but I didn't have my music on this page. And so I just played it with him. And made it through to the, you know, to the, the, the syncopated hit. And it was all perfect. I'm like, wait a minute. I have memorized this. Mm -hmm. And, and now when we come to that point in the show, I make sure to get my music on the right page in case I need it. But then I close my eyes and I just play the song and it's so much better for everybody involved, including me. Cause it's enjoyable. Cause I'm just, wait, so your reflection on this is that, is that there's a, there's a trick to. Uh, or, or we fool ourselves into thinking we haven't learned something. We have learned something. Yes, it, that's exactly it. It's the crutch. 
of and and we we do this all the time with lyrics or you know chord structure sure. or whatever it is and here's this super difficult thing that after i mean i you know again i played it probably 30 times 7 years ago but it was very different it was not with sticks it was a different pacing of the show the vamps were counted differently because that's how shows work right you know different productions have different timing needs and all that thing and um so it really is like a new thing for me, but it's a song I've heard before, you yeah. know, and that's probably true of a lot of the things we do. Even if we don't know it, it's, it might be a song we've heard before and testing that, that opportunity, th that accidental opportunity to test myself on whether or not I had this memorized was fantastic. Cause it was like, Oh, I know this. And now with confidence, I play it every time. Now, of course, the way they're doing these shows, um, th now that we've gotten through Tech Week, where we had five shows in the first weekend, uh, although one was canceled due to snow, uh, every other weekend only has two shows. So I don't play this again until Sunday. So I have I played it last on Saturday night, and now I go play it again on Sunday afternoon. So we'll see how good my memory is in that moment <laughs> after a week of being away from it. But but yeah, I I think forcing ourselves away from that crutch and the way that I'm doing it in the show is I'm just closing my eyes. Nobody's watching me. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not visible to anybody except band members in the pit and they're all kind of, you know, buried in their music. So I don't think anybody even knows that I've been closing my eyes and doing this, but doing that. Once it's committed to feel you are ahead it. of the game. Yes. It is the decision about when it's committed to feel. It's what I'm hearing you say is yeah. that like, you know, learning to trust yourself is an interesting And actually we haven't, we haven't, dove into this nearly as much as I would like to on this show. My, I, I have this odd ADHD when it comes to learning songs. I say, I'm listen, I'm going to learn a show of acoustic music, two hours yep. threaded, you know, what works well. And then, Oh, there's a squirrel. And you know, you go off oh, that song <laughs> would be cool. And then, which, which leads you to seven other songs. So discipline is certainly one of it, but sure. the, the, the skill of learning stuff. And I agree with you wholly. What I'm one of the big things that's jumping out of what you're saying is once you commit to the crutch, your brain does not want to not have that crutch. You no. know, your brain is going to give you as many reasons why as possible to rely on the crutch. What is like with, with learning lyrics, especially sometimes songs that you know don't have a great story to them that make a lot of sense to me. You know, right. I right. I'll write them out. I'll, you know, the, I used to do that in planes all the time is just start writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Ah. And then, in, in the, you know, I start hearing a voice in the back of my head saying, well, your brain is, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, all you're doing is rewriting and writing and your brain is going to say, see, it's written down somewhere. You can go get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, there's that. So, yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, music is one thing because you can commit it to feel and certainly on guitar, you know, there's repetitive yeah. sections. It's not nearly as much as lyrics, but l memorizing lyrics and getting rid of the crutch and learning to trust. Uh, it's weird. Some songs lock right in and you know, the story makes sense. Um, um, what's, what's a song that's really, really hard would be. Um, um, uh, it's a Beatles song and it's dun 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 dun. Um, anyway, there's no story to the song. At sure. All. Okay. Yep. Come together. Oh yeah. Here come. I, and interestingly enough, how do you, how that's do you memorize come together. Come to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to merge two, two of my shows here because this song came up on Mac Geek Gab a couple of weeks ago. So if you know the answer from there, you can send it in here too. But does anybody out there know whose campaign song come together was written to be? Someone asked John Lennon to write a campaign song for them and what came out was come together. So let us know feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But you're right. It's gibberish. It's, it, it, it makes no sense. There's Most, nothing to hang on to as you're trying to commit it to memory. There's no, yeah. there's no, there's no associations that get you from one line to the next one. No, no. Other than the ones that you have to intentionally make in your brain to link from section to section. Right. But yes, they, they, it doesn't have any, like you said, there's no thematic connections that happen. It's what do you do to memorize lyrics? Um, I sing them, but I, 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 I suppose it's, it's similar to what I'm talking about with this, with this song here is learning it as a song. If I have a crutch in front of me, I am playing what the crutch is telling me to play as opposed to if I can get to the point where I internalize it 
and can turn off the crutch. Now I give myself the ability to actually play and in the, in the, you know, in the right scenarios, sing the song as opposed to just reading lyrics and, 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 you know, saying, saying words in tune and in time, there's two yeah. different things, right? And and you can you can bridge that gap. And as a pro, you've probably learned how to bridge that gap, folks, right? Like you, you know, you you see the line, you're like, right now I remember this line. Now I'm going to sing this line from memory, but it's from memory of five seconds ago when I when I saw the first word, you know, on the page or whatever. Like yeah. that's that's something that we all sort of do. But I can tell you, having just gone through it, that even at that level you're pulling yourself out of the song. You're not giving the best performance that you could uh, for yourself or for anyone else. Like it's, it's good. It's not going to feel as good uh, if, if, as it would, if you just played it from well, memory. We've had this conversation yeah. about, you know, cheats and pads on stage and all that type of stuff and got very religious feedback. Like it doesn't matter, of you know, that type of stuff. And, you know, my principle has always been, it has to matter by definition if people are watching you perform, if you're, you know, background music and, and, um, and you're not the center of things, I get, I guess I can get to that more, but if you're sitting in a place where people are sitting in chairs, facing you, listening to what you have to say, that connection, um, is, is about emotion, emoting things and yeah. not reading things. Right. And so I, I still feel very strongly about that. Many people do not feel strongly and I get it. And if it works for you, but, I know once I go to brain mode and have to read and have to be conscious of reading and then actually worse, once you are conscious that you're engaging your brain, then you start going through a checklist of all the fail safes that you have right. to not screw up. Right. Right. I watched um <clears throat> the Miley Cyrus played a. It was awesome. Yep. And awesome. and she had Joan Jett come out band. for a couple of yeah. tunes, right? And one of the, the first thing that I noticed, and and my wife had to remind me of it, was that all the people in the crowd were just like it was like a normal concert. And she's like, right, yeah. those are the seventy five hundred vaccinated healthcare workers. I'm like, right, right, what a beautiful thing to see. So that was really great. But Joan Jett, she did at least the the snippet I saw. I think she did three songs with Joan Jett, but I saw two. I saw her do Bad Karma. Um, which, which I guess were, was a Miley song, uh, on right? On her new album. Yeah. On her new album. And then they did Bad Reputation. Uh, she did Hate Myself for Loving You. And then Hate Myself for Loving You. Right. Okay. I didn't see that part of it. Uh, the snippet that I saw just had those first two tunes. And Joan was reading clearly, reading lyrics for Bad Karma off of a teleprompter right in front of her. And it was obvious that she was not in the song she was playing along with what was, you know, shown to her on the teleprompter. And she was very, she was doing her best to like glance down at it and then, you know, and then sing. She understands yeah, being which a Which is what you try to do, right? But it was way too obvious that she was not in it. And then Bad Reputation started and I saw her doing the same thing. And she caught herself like, wait a minute. I know uh -huh. this song. Like, if I don't know this song, why am I up here? And, uh -huh. and she, she detached herself from it, but it took her a few lines of bad reputation to be like, what am I, why am I reading this? And the reason I know the answer why she was reading it because it was there, you know, that crutch is really attractive in the moment, yeah. it's, you know, like, and that's the problem. Well, you go to it because yeah. once you are aware that a, a mistake is possible and actually, you know, I, mistakes are not the best thing, but it would be an interesting discussion would you rather be off book and deal with a mistake in the moment? Now, again, you're, I, I'm going to assume that you, anyone listening to this is going to the effort in good faith to come up with a good performance, you know, that they prepared sure. and they rehearsed, right? Sure. And then you get to that moment. And I find often mistakes happen once you go to your brain. I mean, it, it, mistakes from lack of preparation from musicians who, you know, are professionals and in good conscience more likely what a, what a mistake is going to happen is that is that brief nanosecond when you get in your head and think about should I do A or B and inevitably C comes out. And, uh, yeah, 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 know. yeah. Well, that's, right? that's that old Jaco Pastorius uh, line, right? When, when Peter Erskine joined Weather Report, he was young and petrified because here he was playing with like serious cats. And to be fair, Peter Erskine, Erskine is and was a serious cat, but you know, he was petrified joining this, this outfit mm -hmm. 
And Jocko said to him, hey, man, don't think so much. Just concentrate. Yeah. And and that's what you're saying here is and you're totally right now. Of course, that's way easier said than done. But it, if you start thinking about it, that's that nanosecond where everything falls off the rails. And that's the nanosecond where you want to have the crutch. Right. You want to be able to fall and catch the crutch. I guess I guess if we're going to take the analogy even further. It's like, well, if if to use a pair of crutches you would want them to be set at four feet high. Well, set these at three feet high. Let yourself fall a little bit so that the crutch isn't so easy to grab, but easy enough that you're not going to like completely sure. fall flat on your face. Right. Like, yeah. And I don't like, yeah, I don't know how to, how to accomplish that musically. I mean, <laughs> my way of doing it is to close my eyes. Right. I mean, or this weekend, you know, what I found was I'd close my eyes. So I know the crutch is there, but I'm much better just concentrating and playing but if I have to, I can open my eyes and then I've got to orient myself to the page and, you know, find my place. You're and, in your brain. You're and, in your yeah, head. Yeah. Now I'm in my head. You're doing mechanical things. Yeah. Now I'm doing mechanical things. So the crutch is a foot away than a foot further away than I would want it to be. But it's there just in case, you know, if I really. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So, you know, I would say that that is probably one of the biggest things that hold me back from doing more interesting things in a performance rise is, a, well, A, the ADHD of and discipline of being able to focus and just learn the show I want to learn. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then, then it's the, you know, memorizing lyrics, you know, the music seems to come easier for me and, and, you know, it, it locks in, locks into the point where I feel free to like stretch, you know, yeah. add fills, you know, add all substitute chords, that type of thing. That, that stuff seems to come much more easily, but now I worry about lyrics and I worry about, you know, I worry about worrying about lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's it. Yeah. And it, that's it is when you're playing the song, you can have fun in those moments of either like really locking in the groove or like you said, having a little bit of room to improvise around what you know the structure is. So, you know, you're always going to be where you need to be, but you've got a little bit of room to play and, and that's where it gets fun. So people, even at the highest level of any artistic endeavor or athletic endeavor, you yeah. know, pro athletes still practice every day. And it's because you get muscle memory. And when it's muscle memory, you're taking choice out of yes. many situations and just letting your nature, you know, drive the results. And I, and I think that that's a really healthy thing. I mean, you know, great performers still warm up their voices, you know, yes. as a matter of habit, right? Yes. Great. Great performers rehearse, great performers work and work and work. And then you often hear, you know, there, there are some people who just are the outlier freakishly talented people who can walk in any situation and be magic. But even those people in many cases are still some of the hardest working people that you'll find. And it's just because practice does make perfect. And, but well, per, per, as my calculus which, teacher said, perfect practice makes perfect. There you go. Imperfect practice. You're, you're rehearsing the wrong thing. So, and that's discipline, right? And that's discipline. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, our guitar player in the pit for this, my friend, Mike, uh, keeps saying, he's like, oh, you know, can we get here a little early tomorrow and play through it? I want more reps, which is, you know, typically a, a sports analogy or a, a term yes. used in, in sports, but it's, it's that same thing is like, he, he's totally right. Like this gets better when you have more reps, when you've played. You know it. what's so funny about that? So in the house rockers, you know, our rehearsals, and I've been thinking a lot about our rehearsals because when we start to rehearse again, it, it, I have a few things that are, are different about rehearsals. We're going to have to use our time really well. But our rehearsals have been a little bit, you know, like, oh, we'll fix it and we'll learn it in rehearsal as opposed to we'll prepare it in advance mm. and just, you know, put it together in rehearsal type of thing. But the horns come in and they're like, I can read this stuff. Why do I need to, you know, I'm, I'm reading this stuff down and I'm reading it down perfectly. Why do I need to rehearse every time? Why are we playing the same song four or five times? And to me, I'm listening to the song getting better and tighter and, and, you know, getting committed to muscle memory, tighter, but more relaxed, that kind of sweet feel that, you know, something that's really polished has, and again, the horns are like, you know, really, we need to rehearse this five times today. I'm reading the note down and and I, I see it more as a that perfect practice and repetitions do yield a certain level of comfort and and relaxation that allows you to perform the number. Yeah. Even if you're still looking at the music when it's, you know, there, there's phases that that I go through when I'm learning or, or playing a show. If it's if it's easy 
or if I know it, I'm looking at the page and seeing a pattern. And now I know how to play that pattern, right? Like I'm not sure. thinking about, okay, the kick drum goes here. The snare goes there, right? Like that might be the first time through if it's something difficult, but even if it's a new, a brand new thing to me, if I've seen the pattern before, which is really what a lot of sight reading is about is having, having had the repetition through and just like, Oh, I see that figure. I like my fingers already, you know, my fingers and feet for me as a drummer already know how to play that figure. So I'll just play that. That's great. No problem. And that makes life super easy. And you know, for your horn players, that's exactly what I, I assume you are hoping to get them to is like, yeah, you'll turn the page, you'll see the figure, and then you're just going to play it. So a little yeah. reminder of what's next, but not a, okay, this is the note, this is the, you know, hopefully, like you said, gets a little more relaxed, gets a little more natural, and mm -hmm. feels a little more groovy. And then suddenly you can worry about things like blending with your, you know, your other horn players or your harmonies or, you know, locking in with the way the drummer's playing the groove so that it, it hits in the right spot and everybody's you know, nailing those horn hits at the same time, as opposed to everybody was technically correct, but you know, this guy was a little ahead of the beat. That guy was a little behind the beat and yeah, we all played the same figure, but we sure didn't play it together. You know, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. I don't know. There you go. Yep. Yep. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the net net of all this is there is a, there's a point in everyone's process for which trust should kick in that something is in your brain more than you think it is. And, uh, you know, figuring out where that is for any one piece of music or any one person is really a good, a good pursuit. It, it will pay tremendous dividends that will change your performance and, and rehearsal habits once, yeah. once you know, if you put well, in so, the time on something. So, no, I have a thought here. I, I mean, I, I, you know, in this particular instance, I got lucky, right. That, that Andrew happened to be playing. Right. The, the one part when my music was not on that same page, right? It's something I was also working on because it's the hardest part in the show. So no great surprise. But still, there was this happy accident of with no stakes whatsoever. I was able to play this through and test to see if I knew the the part as well as it turns out I do. Right. But I didn't plan for that. And but I'm really like that. That was one of the most beneficial things that happened during our rehearsal run. Right, was this little moment there that freed me from being, you know, glued to the page at this very technically difficult moment. So I wonder is is there a benefit to being to saying, okay, look, we're all going to work on our stuff at home. You know, let's say we've got, you know, you're going to have limited rehearsal time. I'll use your band as an example, but I, I you know, I'm thinking, do we use this for fling and everything else too? It, you know, you maybe the first rehearsal is on book, the second rehearsal book is optional, and the third rehearsal before the gig, it no book. And it's okay if you make mistakes because now you know what you don't know. Yeah. With the book in front of you, you don't know what you don't know, right? So I'm only laughing because having been through this conversation many times, <laughs> you know, I the deal is uh, people handle deadlines. Mm-hmm differently people stress out tremendously about having crutches taken away from them you know but is there is and, there some way that is all in it together like all right here's this rehearsal let's see how we all do nobody's got their books out anymore you know what i mean like is there is there some way of making that a shared crisis as opposed I, to you know that, like and that's that's the task like yep. you all get agreement up front yep right yep get agreement we're not gonna you know off book is our agreement. Everybody in, you agree, you agree, you agree. Great. Good. Here's the schedule and here's what we want to get to. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess Again, that's and the and trick. This, that this agreement. reflects back to the other thing I want to talk about today. So this, this reflects back to, so then we work back from that and here you get into that mushy thing, right? So you have bands who have good ongoing concerns, you know, who are trying to stay together, it's a hassle to find a new keyboard player in an area X, you know, sure. so is it better to put up with a keyboard? In, I'm not talking about my keyboard player in this position, but you know, who, you know, uses his crutch, but at least I got a keyboard player. I mean, you know, this yeah. is what's keeping, this is what keeping a semi-professional band together is, you know, part about is, you know, how much, how much personal wiggle 
you know, can you put up with as a, as a band leader or as an entire band. Right. Right. And that, you know, that, that's probably a lot of reason why, you know, bands break up. They have different goals. They have different standards for professionalism, quality, in, in many things. Right. Yeah. So for sure. this, this kind of leads me to something else I was thinking about as, as the world is going to start opening up again, I have two acoustic gigs. I have one next Friday Okay. Uh, down down where I'm living, and I have one up where I used to live the, a, a month later. So in the in the middle of uh, in the middle of March, weather weather permitting. So the venues have gotten the the green light. Go ahead, you can have outdoor stuff. California, you can get out good outdoor weather in the winter. Um, you know, unless it starts raining again. But anyway, we're about to go into this process of opening back up, and I was thinking about. Um, that that continuum of the semi-professional, the amateur to the semi-professional, to the you know maybe there's even something in between, to the professional bands on local circuits. Maybe we can extract this to you know sure national and global. But you know New York right before we started to go on air today, New York announced a new program called New York Pops Up, an initiative designed to bring arts back to New York State. We're trying to thread the needle. We want the performances, but we don't want the mass gatherings quite yet. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be different. It's going to be creative. There's a lot of stuff that's going to start happening to get um, things going. I know I put an ad, a Facebook ad up, or or just announced an event, and I got quite a bit of um, interest in it for a gig that's a month away. There there is this pent-up demand. I I feel pretty comfortable that people are really going to want to get out and enjoy music sooner than we may have thought, right? However... There is that thing again is, is we've had the great reset. uh, But one result of the great reset is probably not going to be that, that musician scales are going to get reset. You know, we've been, you know, still using that hundred dollars a man per gig is, Mm. you know, that, that started in the seventies. Well now, you know, there's a great reset. We're probably in similar pay scales or, or worse. Um, as venues, you know, try to get their head back above water and see what they can do. And I was just kind of thinking mostly because I had a good phone call from a friend of mine up in the Bay area who called me and and he said, Hey, I'm about to start bidding my band for some winery gigs. What scale? Because, you know, even though I don't need the money, you know, I want to respect that there are people out there who might want this slot, you know, that do need the money that it is their living. Right. And I want to be supportive of that, which is like music to my ears now, but it hasn't always been David. I mean, remember I started, I was a dad band guy. I didn't even know there was a thing called dad bands. I was just trying to start a band. <laughs> you just happened to be a dad with a band. I yeah. just happened to be a dad with a band. Yeah. And, um, I you know, that I was started. like, well, Hey, Mr. Mr. Bar owner. Um, Hey, give me, give me a shot and I'll do it for free. Not having any concept at all, the mm. ecosystem that I was injecting, you know, pain into, right? And and now again, great reset. How does this work? There's going to be a lot of benefits for venues. Should musicians offer t- their services for free for these things? Or, you know, musicians have suffered quite a bit yeah. through all this. I mean, I, are sure. there venues doing benefits for musicians? I mean, I don't know. So I just thought it would be an interesting conversation to kind of go through the great reset, you know, this continuum of, music is different. And for those of us who have day jobs and businesses, the mapping of business structures onto music has some use, but not universal use, right? They are, these are different vibes that whenever you say, would a plumber go out and do something for free? No, you know, it's not the same in music. We try, but it's an art, it's different. And so in there, there's a lot of gray as to what's cool. You know, a musician wants to, first and foremost, an artist wants to express themselves, right? Sometimes they, they insist on money for that. Sometimes the reasoning for, you know, contributing your art to a cause is part of why you have that art, right? But the dad band, I want to, I just want to do it, you yeah. know, is is one that continues to need to be held up to the light, I think. And, and again, I, I was guilty of it and I own that. And I worked very hard to try and make up for those times. <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, but, I think yeah. we've we've all d- dealt with that at some level, you know, I mean, as a certainly as kids and, and when I say kids, I mean, you know, for me, anything in the, you know, under 25 range. Right. But, you know, there were plenty of things where it was like, oh, we can play. Great. Let's go do it. And then even with with Fling, when I joined that band, 
and I had played professionally. I'd been on the road. I'd, you know, been hired for studio gigs. Like I, you know, it certainly had checked boxes, played with members of the Letterman band and Dave Matthews and all that stuff. Right. But when I joined fling, it was, you know, that was meant to be bowling night for us. It, there was no even discussion of gigs. I was gigging with a different band at the time. And then, you know, throughout the the months and probably even a year that I was with fling before we played our first gig, but it was, you know, backyard parties and barbecues. And it was like, yeah, I'll, I'll play these gigs. Like I like hanging out with these guys. I like doing this. And then it was okay. Well now we can move to a club and it was like, Oh, well, we can do that for free too. Like we don't do this for the money. You know, we all happen to have jobs that, you know, pay the bills and all that. And I was like, Oh, yeah, you know, we would do a little bit of that. And then finally it was like, okay, we got to talk about this. Like this is, this is a business for other people playing a backyard barbecue for our friends. Sure. Nobody's making money at that. That's just people hanging out. And quite frankly, if I got to hang out with a group of people, I'd rather be behind a set of drums than with a cocktail in my hand. But you know, that's just me. I'm more comfortable that way uh, when, when there's a stage there. But, um, but when it's a club, it's like, okay, like we gotta, we gotta do this. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on this. I think it's going to be interesting though. Like this great reset, like as you said, what does that do for this? Because I, like, I don't know what that answer is. It's, is it, are there these, we're all in it together gigs where everybody's sharing in the proceeds from the night where, you know, you're getting a piece of the door, or you're getting a cut of the, the bar or whatever that is. Do we, do we go back to that? And I'd realize a lot of us, uh, or playing gigs where we are doing that, but at a lower, like it, those are those higher level gigs, right? The, the 200 to 500 to thousand seater things. It makes a lot of sense to not just take a guarantee to take a, a slice mm -hmm. of, of the door. And if you're not doing that, or if you haven't been doing that, really think about it folks. But otherwise, you know, for the, for the, you know, 40 to 150 person gigs where it's basically been a guarantee um, that's, you know, like you said, a hundred bucks a man. I don't think those are going to be guaranteed gigs coming out of the gate with venues. Yeah. And, I, I tend to agree, uh, you know, and I don't blame them. Like I understand this, but we got to be careful not to set the wrong tone. If, if it's going to be a, we're all in this together thing, well then let's all actually be in this together. And, and let's talk about, you know, for me, when I was, when I was playing in the earlier days, it was always a, it was a, a, you get the door plus 15% of the bar or 10% of the bar. And, and that acknowledged to me, that acknowledged what was actually going on here. And th these were like my college gigs and stuff where, you know, we would bring a lot of people in, into these clubs. And so it made sense that we would get the door because people paid. And now if we're keeping them here, we also get a cut of that. And, and that, I don't know, like. It seemed fair. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think as you're saying this, I'm kind of reflecting that it has gone to the place where nobody can really, um, nobody can support themselves as a musician now. Right. You know, as a gigging musician, as a local gigging musician. Yeah. I was going to say as a cover band gigging musician. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you if know, you're gonna, but if you're going to be doing corporate wedding gigs, you, you certainly could. It, it, once those events come back, but yeah. Yes. You, well, you probably can as a, as a band leader who's getting a piece. Don't know if you can get it as a, you know, what you're going to get 500 bucks to play a corporate gig or a, or a, or, or a wedding once, maybe twice a week. That's not going to, that's not going to support anybody. Right. I don't know. Even when you add in a hundred bucks a night, you know, yeah, four, 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 four grand a month. I think you might be applying Silicon Valley cost of living there, but, you know, four grand a month. Uh, I, I know plenty of musicians who make 50 grand a year and are, right. are fair, okay fair with enough. that. Right. But it's, I mean, you know, it's like that. And, and, and then you add in lessons. The point I was trying to make week. is that, yeah. yes, yes. And that's the key. But the point I was trying to make is once it became clear that in the seventies you could make enough to live on. Yeah. And then, and then that scale didn't change over time as, you know, as, as smoking laws and, drunk driving laws and, you know, these types of things started, started to come into play. The dad bands could take those gigs is what it was. Right. right. And, and I think that's kind of when 
when you couldn't really be a full-time professional or it was risky to be a full-time professional, that's probably when the prolifer or, you know, maybe the, maybe it's just 20 years after the sixties and seventies and eighties, you know, that music still had a market and the only people playing that were the people who were around then that might be another way to look at, you know, how we got to where we are. I think the thing that I get to is it's just important that the semi-professionals have a cognizance of if you want quality art in your area, um, you have to allow the professionals or the semi-professionals, depending upon which way you're coming from it. Yeah. You know, you have to respect that there, that a scale, you are part of putting your finger on the scale and um, music has value. And, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's kind of, just an important thing as things reopen up. There might be a gold rush of semi-professional bands or amateur bands that, you know, come out of this. There might be not be right. Yeah. You know, there might be maybe venues will say, all right, we're resetting and I want to do music right this time. We kind of like got the lowest common denominator and, and momentum took me in the direction that I didn't really want to go. Right. But, um, right. you know, Right. Yeah. It, it, yeah. This is what happened. Yeah. And here I am. Yeah. Yep. So we'll keep our eye on it and, um, you know, we, we will think about, we'll report on it. I'm certainly, I'm, you know, I don't know which of my venues are going to be available. I don't know when we, I have, I just booked a wedding gig today for the fall. So I got nice. one, but, um, yep. but, uh, corporate gigs, you know, when companies are going to actually call people together, will they want to celebrate this Christmas that they got over that they got all through this? Right. We'll Maybe. see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that might you know, be the of, soonest, right? Because yeah. a lot of companies aren't even having their employees, like aren't even planning to have their employees come back to the office anytime. Right. Like yeah. they've just figured yep. it out, like stay remote. So, yep. yeah. But you know, maybe, maybe companies will take the money they're saving on office rent and say, we got to, you know, continue to invest in, in company culture. So yeah. when we do get gatherings, they have to be really cool. And, you know, maybe that, that will be a, a side play that'll come out of that. But that's true. I just think yeah, you know, the message true. that I, I just think to share is go into this reboot, this great reset with your eyes wide open, have a plan, talk a lot, continue to push value. Going back to our original conversation. Yeah. You know, if you're a musician, offer something of value, which is, you know, a polished performance that that's what you have. And, um, you know, try to engage, be, be part of the solution of getting scales up for working musicians. Yeah. I think it's going to take some conversations with venue owners and, and, and other local, you know, uh, acts, bands, musicians, whatever it is, like just keep the conversation going, talk yeah. with each I mean, other the, about what clearly you're Clearly the venue owners yeah. are going to be freaked out, you know, yeah. the, what they've just gone through and, and that's to be understood. And, you know, a good partner should understand that, right. but it should be understood both ways because again, Absolutely. musicians have, musicians have, have suffered through this quite a bit as well. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and be careful when you say, are we all in this together? That's, I think that's one of the traps, right? You know, be discerning how you listen when someone says we're all in this together. If there's no indication that there's upside for all of us when, right. you know, once we oh, no, figure that's, this out, yeah, it's no, a I'm, bad relationship. I'm glad you, yeah, as I'm saying we're all in this together, that's what I'm thinking. It's like we all actually need to be in this together. But you're right to call that out because it it's it can be lip service and nothing more to, to say that nice little catchphrase. Uh, but yeah, no, it actually has to exist. And and and, and, and be mutually beneficial and mutually risky. Like that's how those things work when you're all in it together. Everybody has risk. Everybody has potential reward. So, yeah. and just to close a good example of that would be, you know, I'm willing to do a piece of the door, but can we set some, can we set some barrier where if the door does well, I, I do a piece of the bar. Right. If your venue isn't willing to have that conversation doesn't mean you're not going to take the gig, but it it tells you something, right? And you have to do what you will with that information. That's right. Yep. Like how much risk are we both taking on this here now? What's the what's the risk? What's the upside? That's right. And you can find out, like you know, they have their costs too. Just like you have your costs in your band, they have their costs, and it's okay to you know lay everybody's cards on the table. Are we actually all in this together, or is everybody holding something close to the vest? Because if everybody's holding something close to the vest, you're not in it together. New, that's right. your news flash right there. Yep. Yeah. 
All right, folks. Hitting 201. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us for, uh, for the, the almost hour here, 45 minutes, whatever it works out to be this week. We were a stream of consciousness today. It we? was. Yeah, it was good. It needs to happen every now and then. Yeah. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. What was that you said, Paul? Right. I, 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 always be performing. That's it.